Good morning. Uh, thank you, Emily, and thank you, everyone uh, at ProImmune for um, putting together this wonderful symposium uh, and for giving me the opportunity to talk about um, our um, um, my work on the effects of cotton optimization on biotherapeutics with implications in uh, immunogenicity. Oops. Okay. I come from the FDA, hence the disclaimer. So in the FDA, my role is both uh, a regulator and uh, a researcher. Um, as a review, or as a regulator, I review mostly drugs on uh, coagulation. Uh, one of them being uh, um, factor nine, which is uh, given as a replacement therapy for hemophilia B patients. Um, uh, um, and and my and the talk that uh, the project that I'm going to pre be presenting today also focuses on uh, factor nine. Uh, historically, um, patients were receiving plasma-derived factor IX. Uh, in the last few years, the recombinant is the, uh, this is the primary choice. Uh, it's considered safer. Uh, but lately, a lot of modified versions of factor IX have been approved, and a lot of these are uh, cotton-optimized uh, version of factor, nines, uh, factor IX. Uh, actually, in uh, gene therapy, almost every uh, version of factor nine that we see is uh, codon optimized. Um, and uh, as I'm sure you're aware, a major therapeutic obstacle uh, when it comes to uh, protein therapeutics is that patients may develop antibodies uh, which can inhibit the function of the drug. Uh, and in the case of factor nine, uh, it can le lead to uh, severe allergic reactions uh, that can be life-threatening. But before I go into the specifics of the research that I do, I want to make sure that, every, that, uh, that uh, everybody is aware of codon optimization. Uh, this is a, te a technique that's been widely used by the biopharmaceutical industry and academia to increase protein expression. It involves synonymous codon substitutions uh, leading to a gene that uh, its nucleotide uh, sequence is uh, dramatically altered, but the amino acid sequence remains uh, the same, identical. Um, because the amino acid sequence remains the same, we've long assumed that there is no effect on the protein. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna show you that this is not quite true. Uh, in general, when you codon optimize a gene, uh, you remove the rare codons and replace them with more codon common ones. Uh, this is done because rare codons are known to be associated with uh, low abundance tRNAs, and therefore they're thought to be translated slower. Uh, common codons are associated with, uh, fast, with uh, more common tRNAs and are translated faster. Um, so, but there are, there are several other factors that are going to play when you codon optimize a protein, but uh, for the purpose of my talk, this is what you <laughs> need to know. Um, so, um, so since uh, um, codon optimization depends on rare and common codons, uh, you, you have most algorithms of codon optimization using uh, a set of uh, data that uh, includes codon usage, the frequency of the usage of a codon in the genome, codon pair usage, this is becoming very popular lately because it shows that it has an independent effect from codon usage. Um, also, dinucleotide content and GC content. These are all things that you need to know before you start codon optimizing your protein. Uh, but when we first started uh, working with uh, codon optimized proteins, we realized that there was no good database that had all these uh, codon usage statistics in one place. What most people were using, well, I don't know if that's what they were using, but what was public and publicly available was a database that had not been updated since 2007. And you can imagine a lot of sequencing took place in, since 2007, so a lot of the data that was in that database was outdated and not useful. So we put together uh, this database, we call it CocoPuts from codon and codon pair usage uh, tables. Um, and you are welcome to go online and check it out. It has uh, codon uh, statistics for uh, all uh, species that are found in uh, uh, GenBack and RefSec. And, uh, and by codon usage statistics, I mean, uh, well, you have codon u the, the frequency of uh, each codon for each species um, in, uh, in their genome, um, and you can uh, compare it to other genomes. You can uh, download the data in tables. You have dinucleotide data. 
you have a common usage table presented in heat maps or you can download them in tables. I, I'm gonna stop here because there's a lot of other features that uh, you, if you're interested, you can go in and check. Anyway, this, uh, this is a tool that it's very useful uh, if you need to code and optimize your protein. But, uh, but I wanna go back to um, <clears throat> the effects of, uh, uh, the effects of code and optimization. Um, we, uh, although most people think of them, uh, think of code and optimization as harmless, it has been shown in several, uh, there have been several reports showing that a single synonymous mutation may be associated with disease. Uh, and in many cases, the, the reason is unknown. In other cases, uh, the rate of, of translation has been implicated or the RNA structure has been implicated. But the fact is that a lot of synonymous mutations, and that's a mutation that does not change the amino acid that's being translated, uh, a lot of these synonymous mutations have been associated with disease. So you can think that if one can cause disease, well, if you code and optimize a gene and you have now multiple um, substitutions, then th there is a good chance that you may have an effect. And this has all been reviewed several times. Um, so what we did with our, uh, what our project design was to take factor nine, um, code and optimize it, using several algorithms and using several levels of optimization. Uh, and you used several expression systems. Most of the, all of the data that I'm gonna to present today were done in HEC293 T cells, but we've also tried different uh, cell lines. And, uh, and then we uh, characterized the, the changes uh, in the gene that we introduced. We uh, looked at expression levels, functionality, and confirmation, and I'm gonna go through all these um, uh, techniques that we use to characterize the conformation of the protein one by one in my results. So, okay, we put in the, our gene in the, in the algorithm and we hit the optimize button and you get a, a, a sequence that's drastically different. And this is just, this is very typical. Like in this case, 60% of the codons have been altered. That's about 22% of the nucleotides have been altered. This is a very common outcome of codon optimization. The sequence is drastically changed throughout. Uh, we looked at uh, codon usage, of course, and that's built in the algorithm. Uh, the frequency of the codons that are being used is, um, uh, the codons that are being used are the codons that are more frequent, that are found more frequently in the genome. That's why you see this red line, which represents the codon optimized sequence, has a higher RSEU than the blue line, which is the wild type uh, sequence. But we also looked at codon pair usage. We also see an increase here. Um, and, and I'm pointing to this because uh, some of the effects that we may be seeing in the conformation of the protein may be not because we introduced the wrong uh, codon, but it may be because we introduced the wrong codon pair. And it's hard to tell what contributes, um, what, uh, contributes more to these changes because, of course, these are interconnected. <clears throat> Next, we looked at the mRNA structure. Um, this is done with um, uh, NUPAC, uh, this uh, in silico prediction. We've tried other um, uh, softwares to get uh, structures. Uh, we may be getting different uh, structures with different uh, software, but the bottom line is that there is a big decrease in the uh, minimum free energy of the molecule, meaning uh, it's now more stable. And that may contribute to being, you know, uh, making, uh, it, it, stay, it stays around longer and that leads to increased expression, uh, theoretically. Um, so, okay, so let's go to our expression data. So we made these stable cell lines in the HAC293 T cells. We looked at their mRNA, it's drastically increased, our optimization works. And most of the optimization works, that's, that's why it's so popular. Um, we looked at uh, uh, protein levels with Western blood, intracellularly uh, and extracellularly. We'll look at it with confocal. Everything says that uh, 
expression is drastically increased, so no surprise there. But we were not comfortable using that system to look at subtle, potential subtle differences in the conformation of the proteins. Um, we, of course, you can understand if you have a cell producing a little bit of a protein and then you have another cell producing tons of protein, you're not sure if the quality control system of the cell is, uh, uh, is overwhelmed or is what's going on. You may be getting a lot of aggregation or misfolded protein just because you're overwhelming the system. So we moved on to, uh, when this is done with antiviral uh, transduction system, uh, we moved on to isolate clones that have almost the same uh, expression levels. So you can see at the, the mRNA levels are practically the same, the protein levels are practically the same in this, uh, in this pair of clones. Uh, and, and with this system, we're now confident that we can look at subtle conformational differences uh, without having any confounding factors. Of course, we purified our protein uh, through a v, his, his V5 tag that uh, we put at the end of the gene and we first looked at it with uh, cellular decorism. We made sure that we had exactly the same um, uh, concentration in our samples, because that makes a big difference when it comes to circular decorism. And we looked at the spectra and we saw differences, suggesting that there is some uh, conformational uh, change in our uh, codon optimized variant. Then we looked at biolayer interferometry. We looked at it with somomers. Um, these are slow or frayed modified aptamers. They're essentially the DNA equivalent of an antibody. Uh, and we looked at binding. And we see that this uh, particular uh, factor nine uh, specific somomer uh, binds with different affinities in the wild type and the, and the codon optimized um, uh, variant. Uh, as a control, we looked at binding with uh, anti-V5 um, antibody and the binding is the same, of course. Again, suggesting that uh, there is a, a difference in conformation um, due to the difference in binding. Next, we moved on to look at uh, cathepsin L digestion. This is an important, uh, important enzyme because it is found in the lysosomes and it's uh, involved in the processing of the protein that is gonna be presented in the uh, surface of the cell with MHC uh, molecules. <coughs> And we saw, I hope you can see, I'm not sure how good the resolution here is, uh, but we saw a different pattern of digestion. If you uh, concentrate here, you see there are two bands. There's only one band in the wild type uh, variant. So differences in the digestion pattern, again, suggest differences in conformation. We also looked at an inhibition assay. Here we, um, we take our variants, we expose them to patient blood, hemophilia B patient blood that has antibodies against factor nine. Um, okay. Uh, that has the antibodies against fi factor nine and, uh, and, and that are able to inhibit the activity of the protein. So the proteins initially have the same exact activity, but as you expose them to the plasma, uh, they get uh, they get inhibited uh, at different start getting inhibited at different concentrations. Again, suggesting that that their conformation is different. In this case, the codon optimized version gets inhibited at a lower concentration, uh, but we've we have examples where you know from a different uh, patient uh, sample. Uh, where the wild type uh, gets inhibited first. So it's not that one is better than the other. It's, it depends on the swarm of antibodies that you get. One may be more inhibited than the other. Again, this, these two pieces of data kind of link this uh, conformation change to the way the immune system is gonna see and is gonna process uh, this, um, uh, this variant, and it has an implication for immunogenicity. So in our next step, we did the ProPresent assay with ProImmune. Um, Emily talked about it yesterday, but very briefly, we, uh, we, they take the dendritic cells and expose them to our two uh, protein variants. Um, the, the protein gets chopped up and uh, presented with MHC 
class two, uh, these are isolated and the peptide gets eluded and uh, they get sequenced with um, a mass spec. Um, so, <clears throat> so this is our data from this assay. Uh, uh, to increase our chances of uh, getting something meaningful, uh, we gave uh, four variants, uh, corner-optimized uh, variants. Um, and I must say, this data is not, these data is, are not statistically significant. We would need a lot more samples, a lot more patients to make this uh, um, more significant. And that's mostly because factor nine is not very immunogenic, so we got a small number of peptides being presented. But the bottom line of this is that there are cases uh, where in the codon optimized uh, versions, you have peptides being presented that are not there in the wild type variant. Um, they are, the opposite is also true. You have these two peptides that are presented from the wild type variant that are not presented from these two codon optimized variants, and only one of the two is presented with this third variant. So again, that suggests that the immune system may see these uh, uh, proteins differently, and, uh, and that could be risky. Um, we are following up the studies with uh, T-cell proliferation assays. So I hope I have given you enough data to, um, to convince you that these proteins may have subtle changes in their conformation. But what we're really interested in at this point is to unravel what is the mechanism that leads to, to these changes. Uh, and we're not, we're, of course we have the intellectual curiosity to figure that out, but mostly we're interested in this because if we know what's causing them, maybe we can avoid introducing changes and uh, be able to produce safer therapeutics. So what we did was we learned to do ribosome profiling. And I don't know how familiar you are with this technique. It's relatively new. I think it's almost a decade now, but it's still, you know, it feels very new. Um, so what you do uh, with, uh, so the ribosome profiling gives you uh, the, Give you, gives you the ability to look exactly what's being translating. You just get a trap snapshot of how, what is being translation in a moment of time. So what you do is you snap freeze your cells that you're actively translating cells, and you cross-link the ribosomes on the mRNA, and then you digest everything that's not pr protected by ribosomes. Then you take these fragments of mRNA, you sequence them, you align them, um, to your transcriptome, and for example, if, if this, this is the factor nine gene, if you have one area of the mRNA where a lot of uh, ribosomes get stuck, it suggests that this is a pose site, and you'll get a peak like that. A lot of ribosomes will be there, and that means that um, it's a it's translational posing event. Uh, and this, this technique has been worked out to such great detail that you can actually, in each fragment, you can say, okay, here is the A site. This is the, the one codon that's translated right now. Uh, and there's, uh, there's two fragments that are being isolated with this technique, the large and the small uh, fragment size. The small is 20 to 22 nucleotides, the large is 27 to uh, 30 nucleotides. It doesn't matter. For both of these fragment sizes, the, you can say exactly which is the A site, so you have a codon level analysis of your translational events. Uh, so, and there's a very strict pipeline that uh, others have uh, established and we have been using, and it's very crucial to like, uh, not to take shortcuts. Uh, you take your fragments, you trim your adapters, you uh, decontaminate it from mRNA, from uh, ribosomal and tRNA, um, and then you align it to uh, a transcriptome uh, reference, and then you map every single fragment that you have in your transcriptome. And so you get a global picture of everything that, that's being translated, but here, of course, <laughs> I'm only showing you factor nine, both genes, the wild type and the codon optimized. And okay, I'm not sure you can appreciate, these are completely different. And I know this, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very small to see, so just concentrate in this area and in this area. Um, 
So this is a representative of the entire gene, and this area at the end is the His5 tag, which is exactly the same with the two, um, in the two variants. So you see these are completely different. There's no overlap between the, like the translational kinetics in the two variants are completely different, but if you look at their tag, w this is the only part that has the same nucleotide sequence, they're identical. So we're very confident that the way we're doing this is very right, is right. We're getting very good quality data. Uh, the translational kinetics of the two variants are completely different. And um, as a control, you can look any, any gene you want in the, uh, in the transcriptome. We're looking here at uh, actin and gap-dh. Um, again, I'll zoom in in two random areas. The, the translational kinetics are practically the same. Um, so that, that gives us a lot of confidence that our data is very good. Um, and um, also uh, another point that I want to make is um, we looked at the translational rate. Um, and we looked at it through ribosome profiling. Um, you, although the kinetics are entirely different, as I show you, for these two proteins, the, the overall rate is the same. That hasn't changed. One protein is not getting uh, translated faster than the other. <clears throat> Uh, and, and that was uh, somewhat surprising, so we also did an in vitro translation experiment, and we got the same answer. The kinetics of the, of the, trans the, um, the rate of the translation is not changed. It's the localized kinetics that are changing. Uh, this, is this is a lot of quality control data that uh, we have to do to make sure that our data is good. The distribution of the fragment size is, uh, you know, as expected. The fragment, uh, the in-frame distribution is also as expected. The repeatability, reproducibility is very um, uh, on the spot. Uh, we're, we're generally very happy with the quality of this data. But, okay, because we changed everything in the gene, now it's very hard to pinpoint, well, what, what change is making, uh, is leading to the changes we see in the protein? And, and that, was, that, was a, that was somewhat difficult to do because, because of the design of our protein. Uh, but uh, we did this cumulative um, uh, sum uh, of the normalized data, and, uh, and you can see, for the most part, the two lines are parallel, meaning that, okay, their kinetics are very different, but you know, one slows down here on, and then it speeds up a little further down and it overall it evens out for most of the gene except this area, this EGF1, EGF2 area where you see the two lines diverging, suggesting that this may be an important area where you know, some events take place that are changing the, the protein. Of course, we need to now verify this with, um, uh, you know, with making new constructs and, uh, and looking at what happens when we only uh, code optimize that area or when we don't touch that and we code kind of optimize the rest. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, when you look at the uh, actin and gap-dh, the uh, cumulative sum is, you know, identical essentially. So to summarize, codon optimization is increasingly used in the design and manufacture of genetically engineered therapeutics, but co synonymous codons are not necessarily silent, and I and we're trying to bring attention to that. So we've used various codon optimized factor nine constructs, and some of them displayed. Uh, all of them ex displayed uh, different expression profiles, but some of them also differences, had differences in functionality and conformation. And we've shown that synonymous substitutions impact the translational kinetics, and that may have impacts in the, may impact the conformation and the immunogenicity of the protein. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and our aim is to unravel how the choice of codon impacts the translational, uh, co-translational, translational kinetics and co-translational, co-translational folding with the hope to help um, and make safer therapeutics. So um, before I finish, I just wanna bring, like, uh, I just have one note on the complexity of these uh, systems. Uh, so all the translational kinetics that I showed you were done in uh, HEC293 T cells. 
But now that we're moving into the gene therapy era, uh, the expression is actually going to start from the liver. And if you target a different tissue, you're going to get expression from a different um, from a different cell. And these cells have drastically different um, uh, uh, codon usage in their transcriptome. And also, they may have different tRNA levels. Uh, so figuring out the translational kinetics of a protein in one uh, tissue that tells you nothing about the translational kinetics in a different tissue. So to try to tackle this, we've moved on with our <laughs> codon usage database, and now we have generated this tissue um, codon usage database where it has similar data as the previous one that I, uh, that I showed, but it has it for uh, 51 different tissues, and we're working towards expanding it. This should be available online starting next week, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to thank you know collaborators and uh, supervisors and um, uh, colleagues. Hava is the PI in the lab. Gaia has done uh, all the ribosome profiling data. She did an amazing job. Um, Jake and David are doing our computational stuff, and you know everyone in FDA and outside that I would collaborate with has been great. Thank you. Have any questions? <coughs> Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a question for the regulator. Mm -hmm. So when you see a dossier and uh, you review a dossier and you see this kind of uh, very intensive codon optimization, would you be asking the sponsor, say we are IND, would you be asking the sponsor to go into this kind of uh, analysis to, to try and anticipate any immunogenicity issue? So, no. So far, I mean, we understand that it's a huge burden to try to get that level of detail. Uh, we would, I mean, we always ask to, disc to characterize your protein as, uh, as well as, you know, as, as the sponsor can. We don't ask for specific assays. We, we leave it up to the sponsor. Um, we're not against codon optimization. We know it's necessary. We know that we wouldn't have all these drugs that we have if you know if you were always using the native protein, which sometimes it's hard to express. Um, but <clears throat> it's we uh, we always ask for you know the the sequence. We do an in silico analysis in our part if we identify a specific. Uh, you know, issue that we think that's a red flag, we may go back and say, well, you know, have you, you know, could you try and do that? But otherwise, like, you know, we, we ask for everything, you know, the standard uh, characterization that we ask for non coder optimized proteins. And, you know, we ask a lot of details there too. We do not add uh, an, an extra level of detail. But, um, you know, if, uh, Hopefully it won't happen, but if we start seeing adverse events specific to codon optimized proteins, uh, we might have to uh, increase our scrutiny. Thank you. Yeah, just um, continuing the sort of the um, thought. Oh, process. and I'm sorry, I have my disclaimer in the beginning that says that's my opinion. That's not necessarily the opinion of FDA. <laughs> just. So, so to follow up on you know any such. Um, Conformational changes. Um, are you looking to do sort of um, small angle cr crystallography or, or things like that? To, to <sighs> yes, for years we've been trying to. Uh, I mean, we don't know how to, uh, you know, uh, to do these studies. We are looking for collaborators that would help us, uh, you know, get a resolution of our protein, exactly what's going on, where the change is. 
and we didn't have much luck. On one hand, we're bound, I, our group is bound by the FDA. We can only work on coagulation factors. And most of the, you know, crystal log like NMR, you know, whatever structure people tell us that this is not a good protein to do, um, to resolve the structure. Um, it's, yes, I'm always open to collaborations to people who would say, oh, I, if we were, I can do this for you and I can tell you exactly where the difference is. Maybe in the future. Given the conformational changes that you're seeing, have you noticed any impact on post-translational modifications? Yeah, we models? looked at post-translational modifications and there are uh, a handful of uh, constructs, I think. I don't wanna, so uh, we have about nine constructs that we're working with. And this particular one that I focus here has no changes in post-translational modifications. But there are some others that do have changes. And there it's a little more complicated. Uh, because is it a result of uh, the post is the post translation modification a result of the conformational change or is the conformational change in the result of the post translational modification? Um, yes, we're we're looking at those constructs and it's uh, you know it's just an added uh, level of complexity that this factor nine in particular has because of all the post translation factor nine has a ton of. Um, you know, uh, gamma carboxylation and, you know, a ton of uh, post-translational modifications and it's difficult to, um, to know uh, what causes what. Thank you. <laughs>